Okay, good. Excellent. And uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, so yes, the, the title of my talk is Solving Self-Absorption in Fluorescence and Nanostructure Analysis of Organometallics. Um, so this is a bit of a, an illustration about the sort of things we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at um, some fluorescence data that is quite heavily distorted by self-absorption, which uh, hopefully is familiar to a lot of you. It's uh, quite a common uh, systematic distortion in fluorescence XAS measurements. And we're going to be trying to uh, correct for that effect and uh, end up with uh, data that is in good agreement with uh, transmission types of measurements. So a bit of a, an outline about what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to start with a brief introduction and a motivation for this work, um, following on to uh, the more specifics of the problem we're going to be tackling. We're going to be looking at the self-absorption systematic distortion specifically, our, um, you know, a, a bit of a background discussion about uh, previous work in the literature and our mathematical formulation for this, this systematic distortion. And then we're going to apply our correction methodology to a nickel two complex data set, um, which is quite a good test case to try and um, correct for this effect and see if our uh, corrections will work, uh, work well and don't introduce further distortions and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I'll conclude uh, and discuss some future projects. So a bit of a, a summary about what I've been doing uh, throughout my PhD. Uh, quite a few different topics, really, uh, quite different areas. So. Uh, my first couple of papers actually were in infrared spectroscopy, uh, looking at a molecule called ferrocene. Uh, those experiments were conducted at the Australian synchrotron, uh, fortunately quite uh, quite nearby for us here in Melbourne. A um, bit of a uh, work on some um, spectral analysis of this uh, infrared work, uh, trying to remove some distortions, uh, correct for uh, some fairly noisy um, features in that data, uh, which is quite Quite interesting um, and applicable across many different types of uh, spectroscopy, of course, as well. Um, a lot of the, the work there is uh, general to spectroscopy rather than specific to infrared. Um, and what I'm going to focus on for today's talk are these two papers here. Um, so we, we kind of have two papers that follow one from one another. The initial one sets out our methodology for self-absorption correction, um, a mathematical formulation for that. Um, and the, the follow-up publication follows through on a data set that we have corrected for self-absorption and uh, flows through with structural uh, and molecular modeling to see what, what the results are for this corrected uh, fluorescence XAS data. A bit of a, um, a really early introduction for you know, where all this field started, um, hopefully familiar to most of us anyway, but of course, um, Wilhelm Röntgen discovered X-rays in 1895, won the first Nobel Prize in physics for that discovery and quite famously took the first uh, x-ray image um, of his wife's hand with you can see the, the wedding ring there. Um, probably quite a large dosage of x-rays compared to today's measurements, but um, what can you do? So uh, then the field continued and the, really the next significant step forward was development in x-ray crystallography, which led to a consistent and reliable method for uh, measuring the energy of an x-ray beam. And of course, for us, that's crucial because all of our um, you know, XAS uh, spectra are correct, uh, uh, presented with uh, the energy of the X-ray beam on the X-axis. And uh, with that, we really can't do very much. So that was quite a um, quite an important discovery. Uh, interestingly, the, the very first X-ray absorption edge or the, the first spectra that would be familiar to any of us was um, uh, measured in 1913 by De Broglie, De Broglie, which actually wasn't the more famous De Broglie, it was uh, the older brother, Maurice, uh, and not his younger brother, but um, quite an interesting um, contribution there. So that's the, the very early field. We skip forward many decades and the first uh, X-ray synchrotron light source was built in 1974, the Stanford uh, light source, which um, hopefully many of us are familiar with. It's quite, quite well known. Um, and only a few years later in 1977, the first fluorescence XAS measurements were developed um, and presented by Czechlovich et al. So, um, a bit of a, a summary about what this fluorescence type measurement really is and, and what the difference is between a fluorescence type measurement and a transmission type measurement. So we have our a synchrotron source, our uh, monochromated X-ray beam coming in. Uh, the um, initial intensity is measured by an upstream ion chamber. Um, and if we were doing a transmission type measurement, we would have a downstream ion chamber to measure the uh, intensity of the X-ray beams that have gone through our sample. Um, and if we instead we are doing a fluorescence type measurement, uh, we wouldn't worry about the downstream effect and we would 
instead measure the fluorescence uh, flourishing off our sample. So we, we have our sample here, whatever molecule or material we're looking at, we have our uh, fluorescence photons coming out and being uh, collected by our uh, usually a multi-pixel fluorescence type detector. So that's the, um, the simplified setup for most of our uh, fluorescence type measurements. Um, and one, uh, well, probably quite familiar to most of us uh, who, who have done any of these type of measurements, you'd find that this fluorescence type measurement is inevitably affected by a self-absorption systematic distortion. And what we mean by that is that the fluorescence, uh, the, the incident X-ray beam has come through. It's uh, gone through our sample to some depth. It's been absorbed, um, usually by a heavy metal atom or something. Uh, and after some time, that uh, atom releases the extra energy as a fluorescence photon. And ideally, it's uh, detected by a fluorescence detector. However, there's a significant chance that that uh, fluorescence photon, after traveling back out through the material, will actually be reabsorbed by the material and hence will never be detected by a fluorescence detector. And we call that effect self-absorption. Um, and it's fairly intuitive to realize that that uh, probability of the material absorbing that fluorescence photon is dependent on how uh, the length of the path length that that photon has to travel out. The, if the fluorescence photon has to travel further, it's more likely to be reabsorbed by the material and hence never be uh, detected by the material. So this was noted quite early on um, by some early papers and uh, some early work uh, found that this effect could be minimized by placing the sample at 45 degrees relative to the incident x-rays. That, that was enough to reduce the amount of self-absorption, uh, but not enough to correct for it properly. Um, and an extreme version of that in, would be having the sample almost perpendicular to the incident beam, um, and hence maximizing the path length that that fluorescence photon has to travel to the detector. So. Um, a, a geometry like this would uh, be very strongly affected by self-absorption. Uh, interestingly, this can actually be beneficial if we want to probe uh, surface structure. Um, so this, this geometry can be useful in some circumstances, but uh, most definitely will be uh, affected by self-absorption. Um, so it's typically not ideal uh, for most, uh, most investigations. So um, a bit of a motivation behind uh, this work and you know, why were we interested in it in the first place. So about 95% of XS research uses this fluorescence type of measurement. Um, the other 5% typically is a transmission type measurement. Um, and those two types of measurements cover most of the options that we would be interested in. So if we have a, a very thick metal sample, for example, uh, transmission type measurement wouldn't be appropriate because it's um, only a very small percentage of the X-rays are gonna be able to penetrate through. So a fluorescence type measurement would in, in that case be much more appropriate and would result in much um, much higher signal to noise ratio in our uh, collected data. So uh, this is an example of a typical um, fluorescence type measurement, and we can see that there are a couple of uh, couple of problems with this data set. So uh, there are many spectra here, but this is actually one measurement. So um, this is, for example, a thirty six uh, element pixel thirty six pixel detector. Um, so each one of these pixels records their own spectra. And we can see that, that uh, these spectra are not at all in good agreement. There are, there are two main problems here. One of them is fairly simple. It's just um, the response of each pixel has not been calibrated well with respect to each other pixel. So, um, so a simple scaling factor is enough to correct for that, just to, to bring all the pixels in, in good agreement with each other for a given number of um, fluorescence photons that they are measuring. The other effect is this effect of self-absorption. And it occurs in two ways that we can see here. So, we, we would expect from a transmission type measurement to see a, a falling trend with energy um, after the absorption peak. And instead, we see either a fairly flat um, a trend or indeed a, a rising trend with energy. Um, so, so those are the really the two problems. We have um, the incorrect trend with energy um, on, on all the pixels and a poor agreement between pixels. So there's some pixels have more um, more gradient than others, which uh, a simple scaling factor is not enough to correct for. So this self-absorption effect is uh, quite tricky to correct for and uh, really distorts the information content of the data. It's, it's very difficult to process this data um, any further without, oh, and have good confidence in the results that you're uh, extracting from that. So that's really what we're trying to correct for. We're trying to remove this effect, correct for it properly, um, but not introduce further distortions in the process. So, um, Many people have commented on this uh, self-absorption in the literature over the years. Uh, 
and many people have um, tried different things, uh, had different mathematical formulations. Um, it, it's, it's been quite interesting looking at the literature and um, different comments that people have made over the years. So um, Thurston's measurements themselves were uh, developed in 1977 or reported by, in 1977 by Jaklovich et al. Um, and possibly the first commentary on some of these problems was made by Gulen et al, uh, who was using a reflexafs technique and uh, commented on many artifacts that were introduced in his measurements um, and came up with a bit of a mathematical formulation to try and describe what was happening here and um, a bit of a roadmap for how to, how to start correcting for some of these things. Um, some early papers discussed how this effect of self-absorption could be minimized by using uh, a glancing angle technique. As I was just discussing, you can change the angle of the sample relative to the instant beam and minimize this effect, which is helpful, but it is not enough to uh, remove this effect. Uh, so some of the first uh, studies that attempted to actually correct for self-absorption um, were, were in some ways limited. They, they required special knowledge of the material um, in order to make that correction. Um, and some of the other uh, interesting, interesting and insightful uh, papers had similar lim limitations. I mean, there was a paper by Isabit et al, which was quite um, helpful, but required a series of measurements to be made, moving a sample at each time, uh, moving the relative angle of the sample at each time in order to map the effect of self-absorption and then try and reverse that effect, uh, which is not, particularly practical because that's a very time consuming uh, measurement and, and often we're very limited in terms of time at our, um, at our amounts, so um, a bit limited. Uh, on a similar level there was a paper by Feltzer et al, et al. in 1999 which required uh, prior knowledge of the energy dependence of the absorption coefficients of the material that you were looking at. Uh, possibly the most uh, well-known paper in this field was published in 2005 by Booth and Bridges um, and they made the comment of, of uh, referring to all previous papers at, on this topic that previous treatments have made the simplifying assumption that the effects on the XFs on the correction term is negligible and that the sample is in the thick limit. Um, so that paper was quite effective, um, showed some good results, has been very highly cited since then. Um, but it was a fairly short paper. It kind of, um, you know, for the user, you wanted a little bit more information to actually go and make this correction. There was quite an interesting paper in 2014 by Lee et al, which um, showed some promising results, but was focusing on uh, the, doing the correction in terms of chi rather than the initial mu and rho. So um, ideally we'd like to be looking at the, the initial raw data, um, which hasn't had any spines taken through it or, or um, you know, anything like that, just to you know, make the correction at the, at the start if we can. Um, and a couple of more recent mathematical formulations, uh, Bunker included a mathematical formulation in uh, for self-absorption in his quite well-known introduction to XF's uh, textbook, and Chandler et al. published a version um, re reasonably similarly in 2012, uh, and that's mostly what I've based my work on because I've been working with Chris for so long, of course. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a, an overview of the literature on, on this topic. So this is uh, the formulation presented by Chandler et al. in 2012. Um, and most importantly, you can see that there are many terms relating to the geometry of the experiments. It's, it's very important to measure the geometry of you know, your setup. So you need to know the relative angles of um, the incident beam, your sample, your fluorescence um, detector, and the uh, solid angle subtended by each uh, fluorescence pixel, because uh, without that information um, measured during your experiment, it makes it very difficult to correct for these effects post facto. So uh, that, that is certainly something that's quite important. And fortunately for the data sets I've been using, uh, those measurements were taken during the experiment. So we can see that um, this omega term is the detector pixel solid angle, um, but the angle incident angle, the angle out of the x-rays uh, into and out of the sample. Um, and the subscript F refers to the energy of the fluorescence uh, photon that we're gonna be looking at. And in this case, that's the nickel K-alpha photon, but um, of course it would be different if you're looking at a, a different material. Um, so yeah, essentially that's, that's the equation we want. Um, and we want to solve for uh, muon rho uh, PE star, where uh, PE refers to the photoelectric effect and the star refers to the absorbing atom of interest. So typically, uh, or at least the materials I've been looking at is a central metal atom, nickel in this case, 
Um, and that's the material we're, we're focusing on. Um, so just to be explicit that that's what we're trying to uh, trying to solve for. Um, so initially this looks reasonable. Uh, it looks like you can invert that equation and solve for mu on rho uh, PE star. Uh, however, if you expand it, you realize that um, these mu on rho terms actually have a mu on rho PE star hiding in them as well, uh, which does make it quite difficult. And formally that can't be uh, inverted in that case. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, and we, we uh, look a little bit closer. We look at relevant limits of the materials we're looking at, um, limiting factors and what sort of thing. So in a kind of worst case scenario, if you're looking at a pure monatomic sample, such as a metal foil and where you have this condition met, um, then you find that the XF's oscillations are significantly damped. And in that limiting case, uh, the equation is indeed not, uh, not invertible. However, that is um, a relatively unusual case. So in almost all real cases, we find that the equations can be inverted, which, which is quite nice. Um, as I touched on just before, uh, we would like to um, have our derivations and formulations in terms of mu on rho PE star uh, in, in, as opposed to chi. Um, this allows us to um, make the correction nice and early before um, any spline background uh, extractions have taken place. Um, and we don't have to worry about the, the edge jump or anything like that. Um, really would like to make the correction as, as early as possible. So, um, so we choose to do our derivations in that sense. Um, there, there are quite significant mathematical um, derivations required in this, and I've, I've kept that fairly brief in this talk, but um, I do have a publication on this and the full mathematical details are available in Appendix A of this IUCRJ publication. Uh, so I encourage the interested reader to, um, to check that out if they would like. There are also some extra terms in here, which um, are required in this correction. Uh, and we really want to correct for the upstream and downstream attenuation um, of everything else in the, the beam path. So that might be uh, a cryostat or a, um, you know, a window material or, or anything like that. So um, that's all fairly straightforward. Um, it it you know, would depend on uh, whatever your experimental setup is and you know, what flight tubes or, or whatever uh, are involved in your experimental setup. We do make the, the comment that um, everything upstream from the sample is going to be exposed to the full range of X-ray energies, of course, from the, the synchrotron source. And everything downstream, and in this case, downstream is actually perpendicular to the sample off to the, um, the fluorescence detector. Those are only going to be, those materials in, in that, um, that path are only going to be exposed to the um, fluorescence photons, which will be at the energy of the relevant fluorescence absorption. So, um, we've separated the equations for that sense. Um, these ones will be exposed to the full X-ray energy range, and these ones are just at the uh, energy of the relevant fluorescence photon. Uh, does anyone have any questions or anything at, at this point? So thank you very much. Uh, so now the paper is now the intermediate Interterm the questions. So, is there any questions? If you have questions, please microphone on and ask him. And I can accept a question by chat. Uh, yes, hello. please. Uh, Ryan, great talk so far. Um, thank you. And um, the, 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 the geometry effect that you've uh, been discussing so far, essentially for a, a specimen of um, solid form, uh, do you have the, uh, the formula for a solution um, in kind of a cylindrical geometry? Yeah, yeah. So, um... In a moment, I'll, I'll look at a specific uh, data set, and I think that will uh, answer your question. Um, the data set that I'm looking at uh, is a frozen solution, but it is in a cryostat uh, in a cylindri cylindrical form. Um, so it has uh, windows for uh, the incident X-rays and uh, a window out, of course, for the fluorescence photons. Um, and in this case, we find that the 
Um, the equations do work well for that. Um, it's it's a relatively uh, well, it's not a homogeneous sample, of course. It's um, a dilute frozen solution with um, 15 millimolar nickel complexes um, with uh, solvent around it. That um, the solvent was well chosen to not um, not interfere with the X-ray absorption, but uh, we do find that these equations work well for for that case. Right, right. So, so, so the the equation that you uh, presented uh, work well in 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 either geometry. I believe so. Yes. yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, any other questions, comments? No more. Uh, may I ask one? Oh yes. Yes, please. Uh, if I understand correctly, the critical assumption is that the uh, the background, especially in the bridge region, is almost negligible to use the equation, right? Mm. Yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. Okay, so any, any other questions? If no more, so please continue. Sure, thank you. So, um, we have a mathematical formalism, and we've, uh, we would like to check that this formalism uh, reproduces the results that we've seen in our raw fluorescence data um, as a bit of a, uh, a sanity check that everything is um, working well before we attempt um, to make a correction on a, a real data set. So we've simulated, we've got a simple simulation here. We've um, got some uh, nickel metal uh, absorption uh, post edge. We've, um, you know, it is, this is just the spectra uh, past the edge. Uh, we've fed in the relevant geometry for our experiment, um, and the spectra are color coded relevant to the, the relative pixels. Um, and we find that if we feed in our equations and we, we feed in um, a very simple nickel metal spectra, um, it's just an isolated atom, so that's why there are no XFs oscillations or anything. Uh, we find that we are able to reproduce the rising trend with energy and the increasing dispersion between pixels um, that we do see in our data. So that, that is a good um, good sign of confidence that our equations are working the way that we expect. Um, and so we proceed with re uh, inverting those equations and trying to make the correction um, on real experimental data. So um, I've written a software package uh, called CFLUX, uh, self-absorption fitting for uh, fluorescent x-rays. Um, in order to make this correction um, with real fluorescent XAS uh, data. And this software is actually freely available um, as supplementary information with our IUCRJ paper. So I encourage anyone interested to uh, check that out and uh, it's open source. You can um, look at the, the equations yourself. Um, and that's what I've used for um, this analysis. So the real questions we're trying to answer, um, we would like to know if we can predict to high accuracy the dispersion between the spectra we see um, in uh, distorted fluorescence XAS data. And we'd like to know if we can um, properly correct for the uh, energy functional that we see with self-absorption. We, we see that the self-absorption distorted data has an increasing trend with energy, and we would like to correct that and um, make it in good agreement with a transmission type measurement, for example. This is the, the data set we're gonna be looking at or, or that I have been looking at. Um, and it's quite fortunate that this experiment was done in fluorescence and transmission mode simultaneously. So we have um, a transmission data set that is not affected by self-absorption, which is a good comparison point. Um, so we, if, if we find that our uh, corrected self-absorption self-absorption corrected fluorescence data is in good agreement with the transmission data set, then we can be confident that um, it has been properly corrected for. So we have two molecules, uh, which are isomers of each other. Each other. Um, they have fairly long names, so we're going to call them IPR and NPR for short. Um, and the main difference between these two molecules is um, one of them uh, has a notionally tetrahedral uh, arrangement around this central nickel atom, and the other as a notionally square planar um, arrangement, a coordination geometry around this um, central nickel atom. And that uh, we have confidence with that uh, as it's been reported in the literature. And the transmission type results have also been uh, fully analyzed and published uh, in these two publications, 
and those papers found that the uh, geometry was in good agreement with the, the early publications um, in the sense that they were um, you know, square planar and tetrahedral. There were minor um, optimizations of those structures, but they remained um, square planar and tetrahedral as expected, more or less. So that's what we um, that's that's the background we're working with, and uh, we have the fluorescence data set, which is heavily affected by self-absorption. We would like to correct self-absorption and uh, and then see whether our uh, structural modeling finds results that are, that are in good agreement with these previously published results or not. Uh, if, if not, then that would um, tell us that something's wrong or we've introduced further distortion or, or something like that. So it's it's a good um, point of comparison uh, uh, in this sense. So this is our, our starting point. Um, so on the right, we have the fully analyzed published transmission type data set, which looks as you would expect. It's got good excess oscillations. It's got a falling uh, trend with energy after the edge. It's got quite small error bars, um, and they have been well characterized during the experiment. Um, many, uh, many measurements were taken to characterize harmonics and uh, beam width and all that sort of stuff during the measurement. So we have uh, good confidence in those error bars. Uh, and that's that's what we're going to be comparing to hopefully ending up with um, a data set that is in good agreement with that uh, as the fluorescence and transmission measurements were taken simultaneously and this is our starting point for the fluorescence and clearly this is not in good agreement with the transmission measurements we have um, not only a poor agreement between um, the fluorescence and transmission but a poor agreement between each of the fluorescent spectra um, remembering that each one of those spectra uh, uh, correlates to an individual fluorescence pixel, uh, and those were measured simultaneously, they should be in good agreement. Um, but as we've discussed, there are two key problems. Uh, the initial one being a poor calibration um, with individual fluorescence pixels um, not being as sensitive as, as one another. And that's quite a simple fix, it's just a, an overall scaling factor. But the bigger problem being the self absorption distortion, uh, as we find. Um, the incorrect trend with energy and uh, an inconsistent trend with energy across different spectra. So that's our starting point um, for our, our raw data. We make the we then make the correction for self-absorption using the equations that I discussed earlier. Um, well, actually, much more complicated ones that are, um, that can be found in Appendix A of that paper. Um, but essentially, we feed in uh, the uh, raw fluorescence data. We feed in the relevant geometry, which fortunately was measured to good accuracy in that experiment. Um, and this is now the same 36 spectra that I just showed you, um, which are now uh, very nicely collapsing on top of each other. They're, they're in very good agreement with each other. And uh, also importantly, they're in very good agreement with the uh, published transmission data, uh, which is overplotted in black. So um, we find that the dispersion is practically gone between the individual fluorescence pixels um, and the spectra, the fluorescence spectra are now um, in agreement with the transmission type measurement within uh, within the level of uncertainty, which is a great result. So we published a paper about this um, in IUCRJ. Um, the full details can be uh, found in that paper, of course. Um, and the paper is now doing quite well. We're very, very happy that um, what is quite a technical and complicated paper is, is now getting a good number of reads and a good number of citations. So um, yeah, we're quite happy with that result. So that's all well and good, but that is um, obviously still in terms of muon rho versus energy. And we would like to convert to chi and proceed with uh, structural modeling to, to reveal um, and confirm or deny whether the uh, structural modeling results are in good agreement with the transmission type measurements. So this is the same data converted into chi, um, well, scaled by k squared chi. So we've got the, the transmission and fluorescence data um, overplotted with each other. And it's quite interesting uh, how these results uh, compare and contrast. We find that uh, overall, or it's particularly uh, higher in K, the transmission type measurements have smaller uncertainties, which kind of makes sense. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, you have access to more, um, more of those systematic effects that you can calibrate with a transmission type measurement um, using daisy wheels, for example, um, many other those things which aren't really practical with a fluorescence type measurement. Um, so that kind of makes sense. But we do find that lower in K, the uncertainties are smaller in the fluorescence type measurement, which is quite nice. It means that these two spectra, uh, two types of measurements can be used in a complementary manner. Uh, and we find that 
the transmission type measurements were already published, already fully analyzed. Um, and when overplotted, the fluorescence type measurements actually give us more insight into their um, certain features. So these two features here, sort of a, a little hump and a, a subtle point, um, you, in hindsight, they can be seen in the transmission measurement in blue, but the error bars are sufficiently large that uh, they weren't well modeled in the initial analysis. But with the fluorescence data overplotted, uh, you can now be confident of those features. And indeed, we have um, we have well modeled those features um, using an IFFIT type um, structural modeling process. So quite interesting how uh, these two uh, simultaneous measurements can give complementary information um, on the same experiment. So this is a, um, a summary of our final structural modeling results. It's fairly complicated, but I'll, I'll try and explain uh, what's happening in each column. So um, we have our two molecules, IPR and NPR, and uh, notionally one of them is a tetrahedral um, arrangement and one of them is square planar. So uh, in order to check whether, um, whether our data, a corrected data is still in good agreement, it has been well corrected and um, not further distorted, we wanna make sure that our structural modeling results are in good agreement with the previously published uh, transmission type measurements. So we're gonna be using a chi-squared reduced uh, goodness of fit parameter to assess the, um, the level of agreement between the structural models and the, um, the, the data. Um, we find that this is a good, um, a good way of doing it um, because particularly with the transmission measurements and with the fluorescence, the experimental uncertainties have been um, well calibrated during the experiment and propagated throughout the analysis. So these are meaningful uh, uncertainties that we're, we're using. We're mainly optimizing the uh, inner shell um, bond lengths. So the, the central nickel to nitrogen and nickel to oxygen, the relative angle between uh, nitrogen, nickel and oxygen, and then the next shell carbons. Uh, those are the, the main parameters we're optimizing in our model. And of course, um, there are further um, for the bonds that we're looking at too, but those are the key ones that we're optimizing. Um, we've got the usual parameters that uh, are relevant in the excess equation. Uh, and we find that for IPR, uh, we do find the best agreement is with the tetrahedral model, which is in good agreement with the, the past uh, published transmission type measurements. Um, it is quite close, but that's that's also to be expected with what is quite a, quite a subtle difference between these two molecules, which uh, do have the same chemical formula and they are isomers of each other. Uh, similarly, we find for NPR, there is a slightly better agreement for the square planar model uh, relative to the tetrahedral model, which uh, is all in good agreement with what we expected um, from the previously uh, published transmission type measurements. So this is a really good uh, result. It means that um, not only uh, does our data look like it has been properly corrected for when we overplot the transmission uh, type measurements, but uh, if we proceed to structural modeling, we, we do get the um, the correct structural model for, uh, as expected for um, IPR and NPR. So this is a, a really exciting result overall. And this structural modeling results has resulted in a, a paper that we published last year and the Journal of Physical Chemistry A. Um, there are quite a few more details in terms of how we actually went about the modeling and um, limitations and things like that. So I, I do encourage people to uh, check out that paper if they would like the, the full details of how we got that result. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty exciting that we got to that point. So uh, a bit of a, a summary of what we've achieved. We've demonstrated success in correcting for self-absorption on a 15 millimolar nickel complex XAS spectra. Uh, we've released uh, a software package uh, with our, our main IUCIJ publication, so that, and that's open source and, and free, and uh, everyone's um, encouraged to use that if they're sufficiently interested. Um, and we found that our structural modeling results for the fluorescence nickel complex data is in good agreement with the transmission type measurement, which is a really good uh, sort of vote of confidence for this method. Um, and, and we were able to do that really because of our careful error propagation uh, during our experiment and analysis, which meant that our uh, chi-squared reduced goodness of fit comparison was meaningful and we could have confidence in the results that we, we found in the end. Uh, future work on this uh, is, is continuing, uh, actively continuing. So. Uh, there was also another measurement taken during that same experiment using uh, 1.5 millimolar measurements. Um, this is a significantly um, more difficult challenge because um, the sample is, is much more dilute. Um, and also the data itself is much more sparse. It's only about a quarter of the number of data points. So 
Uh, I'm acti actively working on that at the moment and getting some pretty interesting results. Um, I hope to publish that quite soon, along with, um, I intend to translate my software into Python to make it a bit more uh, user-friendly, have a few more features, and I hope to include that as uh, supplementary information with um, a follow-up application on this 1.5 millimolar data. Thank you. Uh, let me know if there are any questions. Thank you very much uh, for your nice talk about the presence correction and application to the nickel compound. So now the paper is open for question and uh, comments. Do you have somebody have the, some questions? So uh, I have several questions, but the first, first I, I, I'd like to ask you about the uh, nickel complex structure. So you mm -hmm. concluded uh, that the one is uh, planar, the other is tetrahedral. Mm -hmm. But how do you identify planar with tetrahedral? Because uh, you know the X-apse is uh, more bone distance sensitive, one dimensional uh, method. Yes, yes, no. Yeah. So the, could you explain more detail about that determination? Sure, sure. Um, yes. It is a good question, and um, it is quite quite a subtle problem to to find mm -hmm. the difference because, mm -hmm. of course, there, there's a lot of symmetry, um, and really the the only signature we have is from the, the inner shell bond lengths. So mm -hmm. um, I, I might just go back to a diagram to make it clearer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so yes. we know that um, we've got our, our central nickel atom, and we've got our um, nitrogen and oxygens. Um, around a central nickel atom, which uh, are really the, the key bond lengths that we're modeling, that those are the, the dominant ones in our model. Um, and really by tying uh, the bond lengths and uh, one of the other parameters we optimized was the angle of this bond length. So like the oxygen, nitrogen, mm -hmm. uh, nickel mm -hmm. value. Uh, so in combination with the bond lengths and the angle is what gives us the uh, relative information of the, mm -hmm. the Nation geometry. Um, if you're looking at individual bone lengths uh, or you know, ignoring the angle, you couldn't get that information. Um, so it, it is a fairly subtle problem, um, and we see that in our results. The um, we have a, a good agreement, but it's not a, a it's a, a subtle difference. We find that um, the difference between models is not mm -hmm. huge because there's so so much symmetry there. Mm -hmm. So the, the Kiyotaka. I, yes, I could yes. add a little. I could add a mm -hmm. little bit to that, mm -hmm. saying that Please. if you only look at <clears throat> if you only look at two-legged paths, mm -hmm. you can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. You must use the three-legged paths because mm -hmm. the three-legged paths then help to explain the orientation and so on. Mm -hmm. So if it was just coordination, um, yeah. you know, maybe coordination plus or minus twenty percent is what's achievable with normal mm -hmm. XFs, mm -hmm. for example, um, and of course. Here, the coordination number is exactly the same, so you couldn't tell yeah, the difference. Yeah, yeah. But if you are sensitive with your accuracy and your error bars mm -hmm. to three-legged paths and the contribution mm -hmm. of three-legged paths, then that helps to define the angle and the geometry mm -hmm. and the coordination. And so although it's not overwhelming, like it's not a chi-squared of one versus 10 mm -hmm. or something, mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, it's a significant chi-squared which uh, convinces that one of them is approximately square planar, fairly close, actually, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. let's call it a rhombus if we wanted to. Um, and the other one is pretty close to a distorted tetrahedron. And, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. we can actually determine even the changes from the notional crystal geometries uh, because of the significance involved. So it is subtle. It's mainly three-legged path type information that's critical because that mm -hmm. changes it from a one-dimensional to a two-dimensional. Yeah. 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 So okay. it means the, you uh, include the multiple scattering yes. to analyze the angles. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. So any other questions? Yes, please. Yes. Thanks, a very nice talk. I just want uh, a, a general question to techniques. Uh, you made a solo comparison with uh, fluorescence detection over transmission methods. So, so what is uh, uh, the demand or uniqueness of uh, fluorescence over the transmission geometry? Uh, 
And as the last slide you showed, actually, you, you plan to go very dilute system. Is that um, sensitivity is one of the advantage over the fluorescence technique, or if the, this one, are there many others? Sure. Um, I think I missed your, your first question. What was that, sorry? Well, just the reason for fluorescence detection over transmission. Right, because right. you use a fluorescence for, sorry, you use transmission one as a model to verify your method. And there got to be a motivation for that. Eventually, you, you like to do fluorescent detection over transmission, right? So the gap giving you, I don't know, it looks like maybe sensitivity could be one because uh, you, you're planning to do 1.5 million more solution, uh, low concentration solution, maybe in that uh, level of concentration transmission is hard to do. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a good point. Um, we, um, our main recommendation would be to try and do both methods at the same time, if possible. Um, of course, at every beamline, it's not necessarily practical or whatever, and it does result in a, a significantly larger number, uh, larger amount of data analysis because you have two data sets to analyze, but. Um, in this case, we find that the, um, the data is complementary. You can get different information from both data sets. Um, you make a good point with the, the 1.5 millimolar data. It is um, certainly a lower signal to noise ratio because it's a, it's a weaker signal. Um, but we're confident that it will still work. That the same uh, analysis methodology will still work. Um, and, and it is helpful, in at least in these initial cases, that we do have a transmission type measurement um, as a bit of a, at least from um, the historical way that I approached it, uh, I already had the transmission data published and fully analyzed. So uh, for me, that was a good point of comparison, but um, of course in, in future analyses that um, a historical uh, logic might not be there um, or, or you might only have a fluorescence measurement or, uh, or only a transmission in that case. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it could be the case. That it could be the case. The sample itself, you can't do transmission, right? So, so yeah. if you verify your fluorescence technique, it, it, it's a, it's wonderful. Uh, just in general, to see if there's a certain advantage for people just using fluorescence mode, and also especially when you go heavy elements, the signal to fluorescence it's uh, probably stronger, and, and then you, you you may have certain advantage. Yeah, just like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jing, well, that, that, is, yep. that is the reason normally uh, beamline scientists will say if it's particularly dilute or whatever, then, yep. uh, then you quote unquote should use fluorescence. Whereas mm -hmm. if it's very strong, like a metal or a foil or a reference, then uh, perhaps the recommendation would be for transmission. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, we're blurring those distinctions, at least mm -hmm. across a range of energies and a range of uh, concentrations. Um, so the jury's out at some level. But just because of the uh, disorder or complexity or dilute systems, people would normally use fluorescence for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so that's a partial answer to your question. Would that, would that be a way you go very low concentration, the self-absorption will be different? Did you do a concentration dependence for that? Um, it's an interesting point. Uh, I think the general method would still work. I think. Um, Yes, I think you would have limiting cases. So I think a, a very dilute uh, situation, um, the effect would be diminished because there's less sample in the way for the fluorescence photon to be reabsorbed. Uh, but I wonder whether that would um, also be correlated with a, just a reduction in um, signal in the first place. So I'm not sure which one would run out first, like whether um, the sample would be so dilute that you wouldn't get a measurement or whether the um, effect of self-absorption would, would also diminish. Um, I haven't personally looked at a, a data set that dilute, but it, it would be interesting uh, to, to quantify. Thanks. Okay. So next, uh, Dr. Kan Trang. Yes, uh, please. Uh, very, <coughs> excuse me, very nice talk, Ryan. Now, um, mm -hmm. the correction, um, you use the, um, I guess you use the uh, theoretical prediction uh, value for mu. Uh, is that correct? 
Yeah, so, um, so some of the mathematical details which I, I skipped over in this talk are uh, mostly using uh, the FFAST uh, tabulations for some of the predicted uh, values, which are optimized in the fitting of the software, but um, that is the, that, that's where we get the initial um, estimate <sighs> of the relative contributions of the absorption, yeah. Yeah, in, in, in practice, the, uh, when we take into account uh, the uh, correlation effect as we measure in exam data, um, the, uh, the bulk value of mu uh, in the um, region of fine structure might differ from the uh, theoretical prediction based on isolated atom. And in many cases, it can be uh, a few 10% as uh, uh, Chris and your group, uh, your group have, uh, have, have, have uh, several times demonstrated that. Now, if the, uh, if the absorption, if the bulk, if the absorption of X-ray through bulk material is different from the absorption value that you use, the coefficient value that you use by um, a few 10%, can you see the, the effect from that, uh, uh, from, 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 from that discrepancy? Yeah, yeah, um, so that's a really good point. Um, Yes, I, I'm well aware that uh, there is work to go to improve the tabulations to um, because of the tabulations are of an isolated atom, which isn't very realistic um, in almost all cases. So yes, uh, that is a good point. And um, yes, I'm quite confident that um, if the tabulations were, well, at least in the example that I've looked at, um, if the tabulations were not sufficiently accurate, I don't think the uh, correction, particularly with the, um, the functional with energy, I think that would uh, be visually obviously wrong. Um, if you, for example, if the, the central nickel atom um, was predicted, uh, the prediction was off significantly, um, I think you would end up with a significantly distorted uh, trend with energy for the fluorescence data and um, it would be sufficiently wrong that you could see that it didn't make any sense. So uh, certainly something to be very aware of and um, and, and perhaps uh, for different tabulations or for different uh, samples, that, that would be a real problem. Um, but at least in the example that I looked at, um, we see that the agreement is, is quite nice. Hmm. Thanks, Ryan. Very nice okay. talk. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Ryan, we have a question in chat uh, from Hi. Edmund. Do, do you see? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So, please. Sure, so Edmund is talking about the, um, the physical size of the X-ray beam on the sample and, and the detector. Um, and of course, the, the X-ray beam isn't infinitely small. Um, so we do need to take that into account. Um, and yes, uh, Edmund is, is more or less uh, correct in, in his uh, answer that, yes, we take the, um, the average of the, mm. um, the incident X-ray beam as you know, as the, the point that we're looking at, and that is how we define the angles. Um, I would, so yeah, yes, ideally we would like that to be very well pinned down and to know exactly what the, the shape of the X-ray beam is. Is it you know, rectangular or like a banana or, or whatever? Um, I think that, and that is certainly something we would like to work towards, but I think the perhaps bigger contribution or bigger thing to pin down at the moment is the uncertainty, the physical uncertainty of the geometry as, as measured. So uh, of course, most of us know that, um, you know, an X-ray beam line is, is physically quite large. It's several meters, um, of course, three-dimensional. Um, and so for this data set, I did have good um, geometry measurements that, that were measured by hand with rules and um, angles and all sorts of things, but um, there are limitations to that. Uh, well, at, at least with the techniques used, we um, had limitations on the, precision of a, a ruler and, and so forth. So um, those were taken into account in my model. So um, some of the uncertainty contribution in my fluorescence data was taking into account the uh, possible range of the small possible range of angles that, um, that could have occurred because um, the geometry is being measured over several meters and uh, in three dimensions, there, there is a small amount of variation there and we haven't got a, 
a super precise answer there um, compared to some of the other uh, systematics that we were able to pin down, particularly with the transmission type measurement. Um, so that uncertainty was factored in and included in the error bars for our uh, fluorescence type measurement. Um, and we hope that in future experiments that could be even better with perhaps using a laser to um, really pin down the angles and uh, all the relative geometry and, and absolutely um, really knowing, really pinning down the shape of the incident x-ray beam um, and exactly you know how much is, of that is uh, impacting or you know, hitting the, um, the sample, that, that'd be really important to get these uh, uncertainties even further down. Okay. So, Edmond, is it okay? Cool. Thanks, Edmond. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. I just typed in uh, my answer in the chat. Yeah. Thanks. Very nice uh, talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. So, any other questions, comments? Ooh. We have. We have another one. Yeah. Um, could we clarify with the question um, what uh, yes. Giovanni means by multi layer systems? Um, yes. This is a simple example. Just like a solar cell, for instance, like um, different, different elements, different compositions stacked. So you have, mm. so you have fluorescent solvents that go through not a single. Um, not a single, not a single material, but several. Right. Yeah, that is interesting. Actually, it's it's not something I've I've spent a lot of time thinking about. But um, yeah, that, that that would make a lot of sense, particularly with solar cells. There there are many layers. Um, I believe that the same logic would work, but would possibly need further precision in our modeling. Um, just to to clarify, I guess the order of absorption. Um, I, you know, it wouldn't be a problem for the incident x-rays. It would potentially be a problem for the outgoing x-rays. Um, I think the model would still work, but you would perhaps need a, a little further um, precision or modeling in the, the software just to take account of that. Uh, for example, if um, the fluorescent photon is coming out and it has to then travel through multiple layers to get um, ultimately absorbed by the fluorescence uh, detector, you would want to make sure that um, perhaps any internal reflections or, or anything like that were properly accounted for. I think Ryan's right. I just want to add, uh, Giovanni, um, any heterogeneous system adds uh, amazing complexity to how you correct for it uh, if you don't know what the constitution and what the constituents and what the layers are. However, um, let's pretend you want to look at the surface layer of a solar cell. I think we should get Hitoshi to mention his technique just for 10 seconds. Uh, what? Uh, <clears throat> uh, the grazing incidence um, uh, excess, because that is particularly surface sensitive. So if you're looking at the front layer, that would give you a beautiful statement about the surface layer of the solar cell. And then by changing the geometry partly between Ryan's and between yours, you could actually look at deeper structure. You'd still have to have it fairly well characterized beforehand. Oh yes, if uh, the if you were uh, if you are interested in uh, several nanometer scale in the multi-layer system, it's possible to see by the reflection mode uh, detection. But if it's deeper, it's it's not possible in the in that uh, uh, method. That's not a full answer to the question because hey, the answer would be very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so, Giovanni, is it okay? Okay, uh, yeah, I thought so. Um, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you. So, any other questions, comments? So, no more. Okay, Ryan, thank you very much for your nice talk. Thank you. Thank you.